Yes. There, this is a presentation about video that has no video. So, and I'm going to go faster through it. It was originally a little bit long, um, but I'm going to start uh, with people's misconceptions about video are pretty widespread. And I always go back to Mark Twain about generalizations being false, including this one. Um, the there's a lot of myths um, with about video. The one that drives me the craziest is this statement that you hear see on the web all the time that the brain processes images sixty thousand faster than text. Um, this turns out to be uh, a myth that was invented in the nineteen seventies by a sales guy from three M who was trying to sell their their photographic slide presentation system. Um, but it is a, an, it is an effective medium but only if it's produced with, with, with your client's needs in mind. Um, so we, we have, I think they're fairly common rules of thumb. Um, well, oh, oh, we're questioning some of the common rules of thumb, like is there an ideal video size or length? Um, does the production quality have to be super high or super low? Um, uh, is, there, is there a really ideal platform for all our video? Are there ideal tool sets? Um, the problem is that we're really focusing on the wrong questions. Um, the best practices are really best marketing practices. Uh, the fact that the content is video is almost immaterial. It's not about you. All the technical stuff about video depends on the needs and expectations of the audience, not the messenger. Um, and then somebody in the group that I helped that helped me put this together said, Video is entertainment, and I push back hard on that, but it's really true. Um, it's entertainment with a purpose. Um, marketing 101, show, don't tell, especially with video. I'm a, I'm a ghostwriter. My other, my other half of my career is ghostwriting, so I always tell because that's, those, that's my medium. But in video, you really have to show more of what's going on rather than tell. And the best rule of thumb, if you will, is that not all videos are created equal. And the reason for that is marketing 101 again. Uh, in marketing, we have different needs, therefore different videos. So what we did a couple of years ago, we developed a presentation that talked about what funnel, what video goes with what part of the funnel. Um, at the top, at the awareness stage, you've got your shorter brand videos, you've got your attention getting, um, teasers, unboxing, um, some explainers if they're if they're catchy and fun, um, but as you get further down the funnel, some the videos tend to get longer, not necessarily more slick, uh, but they have to have something for somebody who's already interested in your product or service. Um, at the at the desire phase, you're really talking about social proof. Um, you have testimonials, you have case studies, things that require more content and probably companion written pieces as well as the video so that combined they they produce that action at the bottom of the funnel. Um, I'm gonna really blaze through this stuff because we uh, we always talk about video formatting at, uh, in, internally. And the truth is there's no such thing as an ideal format. Um, when Thomas Edison first did his thing, there were, there were known things about height and width of a video, the aspect ratio of a video. Um, but that's that multiplies every time there's a new device, there's a new resolution. Um, these are these are only three of dozens or scores of resolutions you can pick from. And then, of course, when uh, mobile came along, that number doubled. So there's really no ideal. Um, the other thing we have to be careful of is not to be bound by uh, the latest trends. Um, <laughs> TikTok is is here and it's I'm afraid not here to stay, but it's here for now. But everybody in the video world thinks, oh, now that we have or, uh, vertical videos, everything needs to be vertical. I've had pushback from my team uh, saying, nope, uh, because the format choices and all the technical stuff is really guided by the needs of the audience, not by the devices, they, or not only by the devices. Um, same thing goes with length. There's no such thing as an ideal video length, uh, full stop. If people's attention span is a problem, it, then it's the problem with how you're engaging with them. It has to match their level of, level of engagement with the brand. Um, if they're if it's top of funnel, then sure, shorter is better. Um, but the video has to answer and meet an actual need. That's what makes it engaging. That's what makes it, doesn't matter how long it is, 
um, within reason. Um, and then we, we came back to this in our group uh, a lot, that good video is always storytelling. You're always getting them engaged with something that they wanna know. That they wanna hang on long enough to find out what comes next. Um, um, so uh, on, on the issue of production values, we go back and forth on this a lot, our, our team, because we don't do cinematic videos. We do shorter explainer. Um, but the reality is that all the new tools that are out there have made it easy, easier for amateurs, non, non people not paid to do this stuff to make their own. And this happened back in the desktop publishing revolution. This happened back with uh, with other other media, it happened with Gutenberg. When people were more people were able to do it, the quality took a hit, and people's expectations changed. Um, user generated video is with us; probably will be with us for a long, long time. But it changed our expectations on production quality. If we have somebody in their living room or on the street shooting something on their phone, uh, most people don't expect it to be certain quality. But um, but those quality factors are still important especially if they engage the user with the story that you're telling, um, that with things like lighting and sound, um, if you, you'll know that you've broken a, a user's um, connection with the story if you do something that they notice. If the lighting is really weird and they have something going on in the background, then you've, you've taken their attention away. So that's what good production values are all about. Um, we don't, as I said, we don't do cinematic uh, style videos. But that's okay as long as it doesn't appear forced. There's nothing worse than having a Michael Bay production, uh, high high production value, lots of bucks uh, for selling toilet paper. I mean, just it, it, the discontinuity is going to kill you. Um, real quick, I think I've talked about this here before. Um, there's three general categories for cost: um, do it yourself, what we call do it yourself, or so-called low end, is in the hundreds. Uh, mid-range mid -range professionals in the thousands. Uh, the high-end, the studio stuff that we usually don't touch um, is 10 to 15 or higher. We try, we ask out of curiosity, we ask what it would cost to license a popular song uh, for a book trailer. And he says, have you got five figures on you? Um, six figures, no, five figures. And um, we said, no, thank you. Uh, but that always varies. So we don't post our prices. Most good studios don't post fixed prices because everything is variable. You could depend on a whole host of factors like, is there a script? Um, do we have voiceover talent? Are we shooting on site? Are we shooting remotely? Um, it just, it's it's too big a it's too big a calculation. Um, real quick, how, how am I doing on time, Michael? You got seven minutes left. You should be able Thanks. to see these. Okay, then I'm gonna dash. Um, we talked about platform. There, and I'll do a typical platform uh, where you have different levels of cost, different levels of value. Vimeo can go all the way up to 25,000 if you want interactivity and, and their enterprise platform. But all platforms have that cost value equation. You, um, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a fact of life. Um, but when you choose a platform, obviously the, the right platform for, for marketers or for their clients is it's compatible with their web environment, how they build their web pages and how they analyze web analytics. Um, you always have to take mobile into account because uh, mobile deliver, a good platform will deliver mobile at the speed where your data connection, at the best possible resolution for your data connection. And we'll talk about interactivity in a bit. In a minute. Most platforms though, don't give you their, their feature set if you port those videos over to social. You have to start over again with, with things like buttons and calls to action. Um, Real, real, real quick. Uh, we don't do SEO, but we we tell our clients how to make videos uh, SEO compatible. The text for the title, description, and the captions has to be there. Um, thumbnails AI is starting to take over there, where uh, you can have a thumbnail that's meaningful for a human viewer, but also for um, for, a, for a bot that's looking for um, for search search purposes. Analytics are the same way. Um, you, you you're always counting views, but good platforms will give you percentage viewed, which look like your bounce rates. And if it's interactive, it should give you what your your click throughs or your calls to action are are giving you. Um, I learned this when I worked for a video uh, 
video platform in Pennsylvania. Uh, some platforms only so show how many views. Some are more detailed. They show you you've, that, that so and so many people read 50% or 75% or all. Um, and like I said, the video analytics and the page analy analytics can be separate. And so it's really hard if, you, if they're separate, you have to find a way to, to tie them together to track your usage. Um, we, we've played around with video interactivity quite a bit. The basic truth is that all video is sort of interactive because you have controls that, that let you start, stop, uh, seek, do, do various things. Ads technically are interactive, um, not welcome, but interactive. Um, chaptering, the, the little uh, three bar icon, used to be advanced interactivity. And now most, most platforms let you search longer videos for the content you want in various ways. And of course, there's call to action buttons nearly everywhere. The advanced stuff, which I don't have time to go into, is when you pause the video at a certain point and you give the user a choice of whether to go to a different video or go back to the same point on another video or answer a question. Um, very, very useful, especially for education training. Uh, very, very expensive, however. Um, you want to make video, interact video interactive if you want greater engagement, um, better potentially better entertainment value and convenience because theoretically the user can find what they want in a whole collection of videos. Um, obviously you gather a lot of data and where this is really helpful is in, in uh, learning management systems, LMS um, setups where they, where they use the video as a tool to get students engaged. Uh, the cons of course that it costs, it, it tends to cost a fortune and it's always dependent on the platform. You can't move from Luma One to, to Vimeo and, or, and back and forth. If you can't go to a different platform, your, your interactivity is baked in, if you will. Um, that, <laughs> when we did this, somebody sent me a screen of all the video tools that she could think of, and it kind of freaked me out. There's too many. Um, but the video tools range from stuff you can get. Uh, there are SaaS apps like Canva, um, all the way up to the high-end stuff like Adobe Creative Cloud. And spoiler alert, Adobe is going after Canva with, with their uh, Adobe Express. Uh, so that distinction may not last, last for much longer. And most devices now have some rudimentary editing um, in, in, with your phones, with your, with your uh, tablets. Um, the way you choose, the reason to choose is um, you, you look at your own team, what their skill levels are, or your clients, because sometimes clients have a big part to play. Um, this is people, people continuously undervalue this. What's the value of your time? If you let, if the customer says, I can do this myself, you say, great, but what are you not doing um, by, by doing this yourselves? And then expectations vary all over the place. It could be expectations of quality or complexity. Um, and then the thing I warn people about is there's a lot of shortcuts you can do with do-it-yourself tools, but what's, what are the long-term consequences of taking those shortcuts. If you use Canva, if everybody uses Canva, then all your videos are gonna start looking the same as everybody else's, um, which is one consequence. And then we think we didn't have time for any of this stuff in our other meeting, uh, like, like Gen AI and some of the AR VR stuff that's happening now. No, There's no way I could do it then. There's definitely no way I can talk about it now, um, but I'd love to talk about it. All right. Thank you. That was great. You went through the whole thing and you got it done in 15 minutes, 14 minutes, and actually 13 minutes and 45 oh, cool. seconds. Cool. So um, let us go to oh, let me, uh, let me question Q&A. Anybody? Well, let's do five minutes of Q&A. Um, oh, we had uh, briefly had Keith Reynolds on, but he bumped, he bounced. Um, questions for John. Yeah, Rajiv. Yeah, um, so my question is, John, well, first of all, thank you for that uh, presentation. That was great. Uh, David Libby <laughs> was 100% accurate. He said you're going to learn something, and well, he was right. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, free presentation and endorsement. Uh, John, my question to you is, you said something about interactivity uh, of the video. Is that something that's natively possible by using Vimeo? 
or is that yes how it, can it, you kind of do that with anything else yes yeah, yes and no uh vimeo has if you have the lowest possible level of their platform the lowest paid level uh you can add one or one of several end end actions when the video is done and the only one we use in that situation is the call to action and so at the end of the at the end of the video um you get a a blank screen or a uh, a fixed image screen you can you can impose your own screen uh and you get one button one headline one button and one url so usually that goes to your contact form or goes to an email it I, could go to an email, but I really prefer going to a contact form. Um, the other, the other interactivity things that you get in that level are um, watch other videos, which is makes it just like YouTube. Um, I forget because and there's, you can have a you can have a blank screen, you can have nothing, which may may be good. I don't know. Um, at higher and higher levels of cost, they give you more and more opportunities. I think you can insert mid roll. Um, I haven't looked at that that but mid-roll means something something occurs when the video is still playing um other than an ad because because youtube's version of of mid-roll is of course inserting an annoying ad and U youtube's amazing because when you're when i'm doing research i have to be careful when i click on a video that is something i look for um smart smart competitors will tack on their video to the video you were looking for so i found myself Three or four minutes into a very good video about the thing i wanted to know before i realized that this wasn't the video i found this was a video that was that was sort of a sort of a, a remora attached to the to the shark um and uh it's it, it's the reason i i highly recommend not using um youtube for marketing because you're you're at the mercy of takedown orders if somebody doesn't like competitor can it can complain that it's infringement have it taken down without 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 a hearing um and then they attach people can attach ads sorry long explanation but that's pretty much right. it so john like i know that you have a technology like an interactive video technology as well so is that separate from vimeo or does that yes. leverage vimeo ours ours is still kind of in in the development stage ours has no platform requirements uh we do overlays like a hamburger menu that appears uh like two seconds into the video and at any point in the video, you can say, I want to do something else or I want to make another choice. So it will it will put a, it won't freeze the video, unfortunately, but it will put an overlay that lets you uh, make make other choices. So it's not interactive in the sense that it's not time code based. So you can't say when that event will occur. But we do it. We, we kind of cheat with overlays and have um, it, our, ours would be more useful if if you really had a navigation problem and somebody had a series of long longer videos and they wanted to choose choose the one that they that they wanted to see um and then at some point they could go and they could choose that or they could go back and see something else so it's it's an in in the video frame navigation um we can and i have a demo of, of it if you're interested Interesting. Um, i have thank you i have a uh, quick question i met somebody recently who has developed overlays for it's an overlay technology where you can um, use videos to learn another language or to help you with another language in other words it comes up with the um it comes up with the subtitles and then if you don't know a word let's say you're you're trying to learn english but you're a spanish speaker but you understand most of it but if you come to a word that you don't know you can click and then you could pick that word up and it will come up, it'll pop up a, a definition. Uh, if it sounds like it might be useful to you, it's designed, I think, specifically to help people learn other languages with entertainment, right? Because they'll watch the videos they want to watch, but could also, I believe, be useful for um, even instructional videos where people are not necessarily fluent in English or in whatever language. Does it just pop the subtitles up or does it... The, the subtitles are... Uh, it pops, it creates subtitles from the voice and then, so you don't have to have subtitles. And then what it will do is if you click on the subtitle on a word, it'll pause the video and give you a definition. Oh, wow. Okay. That, that's true, intera true interactive then because it's, it's interfering with the playback. 
yes. for a reason. Um, yes. And that's probably platform dependent, but I'd have to see it. It is. Uh, they've got it running on YouTube and a couple other platforms. Right. Um, so happy to cool. happy to do that. And I put up I, I put up I put up the QR for our interactive demo. Um, if anybody wants. All right. I know we're out of time, Michael. Just yes. uh, just a quick thought. I'm just wondering, John, if there's any stats on who's using video the most. Like you know, I'm I'm noticing that like, okay, there aren't many dentists, right? Why would a dentist use a video because it's frightening, <laughs> or an orthodontist? But therapists are using videos to to, to like explain therapy techniques. It's, it's just yeah. mind blowing. It it is, and that's you know, per, professionals, service professionals are probably the most likely to use video in general, and mm -hmm. uh, the interactive part that we're trying to perfect is is you know, there's so many different subjects if i want to talk about ptsd i want to talk about neurodiversity i want to talk about things that they are that that practice has that would be a use case that we'd like to, to play with for our our interactive toy um and the, the in the in the demo um in the demo on the qr code the second one is a is a fictitious coaching practice that kind of anticipates that I want to choose my message of the week and there's three messages and you can choose which one you want to watch or it could be th three topics of, of interest so but yeah so, uh, service uh, ther therapists would be uh, huge for just video in general okay I'll, I'll reach out to you offline okay cool wonderful okay um so why don't we go into uh into intro mode um my, unfortunately, my um, uh, Evernote is spinning. In other words, it's holding, you know, I can't use it right now. But um, let's go uh, Ron, Rajiv, David, and then our two guests. Um, we'll take, uh, let's say, two minutes. Hold on, cancel that. Um, two to three minutes. I'll put it on two. Um, tell us. What you do, who your ideal client is, how do people remember who you are, what what makes you unique, um, and uh, and then if we'll, how about we do two minutes and then we'll leave a minute open for questions. Okay, I'll probably even take less than that. So I run a negotiation training company, so we look for mostly SaaS companies, all business to business sales organizations. The larger the better. Uh, we do a lot of work in SaaS uh, professional services, so we have a practice that does CPAs uh, and consulting organizations. And any business to business sales force. So um, we do everything from ADP, Google, Oracle, uh, DocuSign's a big client. Um, and we work with any Salesforce size. Um, so when you want people to negotiate and close deals, where are your guys? And uh, if, anyone, if anyone wants a copy of the book, you can download a copy. I'll put a link in it. Um, maybe useful in your own practice. So business to business sales organizations, we're always looking for leads, introductions, referrals, especially yeah. technology SaaS. Right, wonderful. Um, let's. Any questions for Ron? Ron does a lot of. Uh, I know you do speaking, and you go to a lot of conferences. He's definitely out there and based in Florida. Which part of Florida? Florida. Yep. Yeah. And nice B two B tech. B two B tech SaaS, Ron. Uh, and you have a. I know there's Google's and there's big companies on your website. Uh, do you have a preference for what size of company? Uh, we, we go all the way down to, you know, Salesforce is the smallest 10. Okay. And then the question is, what's the best way to introduce you? Uh, well, in, in what, in what format, you know, you send me an email, make a introduction, LinkedIn email, or, or what, what would tell me more about that question, David? Yeah. It sounds like I, I send you an email and says, do you want an introduction to this company? You say, eh, no, or you say, yeah. And then do okay, you want an introduction? What's the next step? Yeah, so you, you can always make an introduction. I'm always happy to have a conversation with folks. So I don't, okay. you don't have to get my, my approval. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in doing. And well, we can have a Zoom call and we'll figure it out from there. Okay, cool. And that's why I wanted to speak to you yesterday because I know we have the same SaaS overlap. You're on the marketing side. I'm on the sales yeah. side. Uh, yep. All right. Good timing. Okay. Um, how about uh, Rajiv? Take it away. 
Awesome, man. Thank you, Michael. So as you can tell from my Zoom background, I'm uh, an assassin for hire. I assassinate scandal from Google. Uh, my ask from the group is to introduction to other marketing professionals since they white label uh, my service. Uh, so I charge, let's say, 3000 to 5000 to get rid of a link. They mark that up to six, seven thousand, eight thousand, 8000 whatever, I don't care. Uh, they get paid, I get paid, the client gets taken care of. It's real simple. And they're then able to offer the same assurances that I offer, which is success guaranteed or your money back. So that's on the assassination game. Besides assassination, I also do product launch. Uh, so my ad, I have a software called Lily Launch Tools that allows for people to organize their go-to-market strategy in a visual interactive way. Uh, the solution or the platform is best served for teams of 10 or more. So one of the biggest problems with teams is communication breakdown between them. And that's the biggest cause for product launch delays. And Lily Launch Tool solves that. So my ask there is introduction to people doing product launch. This could be either agencies that are helping clients with their product launch or consultants or uh, on the client side, product launch teams inside the company that are trying to do a product launch. So those are basically the uh, my ask. And I've put the link to Lily Launch Tools in the chat. Um, I would love for everyone to please take it for a test drive uh, and try it out and give us some good feedback so that we can use that as a testimonial. Very cool. Yeah, my understanding from your prior presentations is that what makes it unique, one of the things that makes it unique is the ability to associate your highest level goals all the way down yes. or your strategies all the way down to tactics so that you don't lose sight of why you're doing what you're doing. Exactly. And that's actually the one thing that separates us from any other project management tool out there like Monday, Asana, Rike, et cetera, because those are focused on tasks and organization of tasks. We're focused on the master plan and then implementation of that master plan, including the task management. So we're at the core, we're a strategic planning tool. So that's how we uh, differentiate ourselves between you know, uh, other tools that may exist. All right, thank you so much. Um, David Libby. Thanks, Michael. I just got a demo of uh, Roger's tool and it's fantastic. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome. His business partner, Lynn Donaldson, uh, gave it to us. Hey, everybody, I'm David Libby. Uh, when I'm not wearing orange hats or setting up Halloween decorations because, you know, today I should have taken the day off. I <laughs> run a BDB tech PR agency. I joke around way too much. That's how I think I'm memorable. Uh, we do uh, PR content. I, I would say that if there's a differentiator for us, it would really be around that we're, you know, and I post about this on LinkedIn. And I, I'm kind of an OBS person, not kind of, I kind of, I am. Uh, you know, I'm when I'm spending the client's money, it's like it's my money. So I'm I'm focused on strategy. I'm focused more on performance, results, lead generation, which is odd for a PR person. But you know, we've got this bench in our content team here, uh, where sales enablement, marketing collateral, uh, white papers, ebooks. These are all these things that we do in accordance with the PR and the marketing is unusual. Quite frankly, uh, we don't just create content for the sake of, sake of creating content, which I think most PR firms have done and still seem to be doing. You know, they're like, oh, let's get blog posts up. So we're focused on uh, more of the, the sales orientation of it. Um, what else can I tell you? So we're working with all sorts of companies in the B2B space, like cloud computing, startups, mid-sized companies. Uh, we love the mid-sized the best because they've got the biggest story to tell. I've got lots of activity. Uh, and uh, they usually have the funds for the larger marketing teams. Uh, but we also love the startups because we've got enough experience where we can be scrappy and help them in many different areas and uh, act as their you know, fractional CMO. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Timing. Okay. Um, let's see. Why don't we go to our guests, uh, Darren Finian. Hey there, everyone. I'm Darren. Uh, thank you for having me today. Very grateful. My business is Harness Data Consulting. My mission is to eliminate manual data entry and help businesses build a single source of truth 
for all their data so they can get to a point where it makes sense to hire in someone like a data analyst, um, specifically looking to work with growing companies that have you know, developed their product or service, they're bringing revenue, they've bootstrapped for many years, and now they're at a point of, of rapid growth and want to move past using their legacy systems or too many Excel spreadsheets to you know, get their operations done. So not a data analyst, not IT. I like to sit between the, you know, the sales teams or the operations teams and the technology teams to discover you know, where are their challenges and then help to implement solutions to streamline the operations. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I want to introduce you to a guy. Um, uh, geez, what's his name? Who, who's into whose whose company does RevOps? Oh, okay. Um, because um, you know they're all about putting systems together, but yeah. not necessarily about fixing the data problems that make those systems um, not either talk to each other or the data itself is 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 lousy. Absolutely right, and it, it's it's difficult to combine systems or have meaningful analytics if you know data is not concise across all of your different platforms, right? And I've seen that in so many organizations where you know one data point will be slightly different in another system, which just causes headaches. Even if you're trying to do a index match in an Excel sheet, it's impossible. So, yeah, thank you, Michael. I'd appreciate that. Absolutely, and Darren is uh, spending his time nomading. He's got the uh, he's got the yes. van. His home yep. is on on wheels. My partner and I have been living in a van for about a year now. Uh, We're currently in Utah, heading down to Arizona next week. But you're in a coffee shop or something right now. Right, right now, something. yes. I'm in a coffee shop, yes. Yeah. All, right. All right. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Darren? Uh, yeah, I guess just one question, Darren. So, yeah. uh, like, I sort of, like, didn't quite uh, understand, like, what it is that you do. Like, can you maybe tell me in a single sentence what it is that you do and also if you can tell me in the second sentence after that who an ideal client is absolutely so i analyze processes to look for data bottlenecks and inefficiencies ideal client is a company that has grown very quickly and is spending a lot of time doing manual data entry multiple spreadsheets or multiple platforms you know crms those kind of things to accomplish their their day-to-day -day tasks does that okay. make more sense Makes a lot of sense. Wonderful. Thank you, Rajiv. All right. Uh, Matt Steven. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I work uh, for an SEO agency called Zupo. Um, I'm essentially biz dev uh, slash the entire sales team. So uh, I'm always in here looking at uh, new networking groups and such and, and thinking, trying to figure out different ones to join. Um, work primarily uh, business owners and or if it's a bigger organization, um, you know, marketing managers, marketing directors, those kind of positions. Um, most companies that we work with are B2B. There's the occasional B2C if it's more of a professional service, but um, the vast majority of our clients are B2B. Um, kind of anywhere from solopreneurs up to small to medium-sized business kind of um we're we're open to to all i'm at the very least i always take introduction calls i'm not in the mid i'm i'm rarely in the business of turning people away just from looking at their linkedin profile or their website or something so always happy to to talk to people um and also always looking for other networking groups so um again m i'm a guest at this one so i somebody referred to them as cheating on michael the other day but uh always open to other networking groups as well um and anything that you guys have found you know success and, and met quality people on all right so you talked about your ideal clients b2b small to mid-sized b2b the owner or the marketing person yep wonderful and you're based where again uh we're in orange county um we work with uh everybody in the you know all over the u.s or um international as well and we can do you know we work on full countrywide campaigns or we work on um, just local campaigns as well if they if depending on what the business needs uh, anything in particular that differentiates zupo um there's a lot of seo agencies yeah, yeah. What so be? one of our, our biggest one is probably that our, our link building is um, digital thought leadership, digital PR. So we actually get our clients featured as thought leaders on 
actually it's like you know the links are coming from real websites that host a blog post with our clients as a guest author and those generally stick around for a while they're not it's we don't just like pay people to to get links placed on certain sites it's like actually a guest posted article a thousand words with multiple links going to multiple sites so typically the the quality of our links and the length of time that those links stay around okay great thank you john you want to talk about your business and either video and or ghostwriting well there's they're they're intertwined um i uh, i have been a writer a professional writer for most of my career but i've been ghostwriting books for about five or six years now um and the the the, the video side started as a part of my regular business my two sons are designers with with video experience and i I can charitably say they volunteered to help me with about 350 videos that were related to a textbook I wrote in 2017. And it was a good experience, min minus the pay. Um, but uh, the, the experience led the four of us, our family, to say, why don't we start a video production company? Why don't we actually do this? So I'm, uh, I, I'm banned from the uh, edit bays at our studio. Um, I, I sneak in and do stuff for my class reunion and stuff once in a while, but I'm not, I'm not allowed. Um, our ideal clients are usually small to medium businesses and authors, especially partly because of my connection in publishing. Uh, we do a lot of book trailers. Uh, we do explainer videos for tech companies. We, we capture uh, footage of, of subjects at these companies remotely. We don't leave the Seattle area. We have a system that lets people use um, their phones, and we send out a kit of tripods, lights, you know, the stuff they won't have, a good microphone, sometimes a green screen. So we set up a remote studio. We have a client in Florida that does videos with us, and we just set up their studio, record them remotely to their device, and then it uploads to the cloud. So we have a whole set of takes, uh, clean footage, um, and that's it. Uh, so our ideal clients are people um, like, well, David, you're the one that referred me to the guys in Florida, um, we uh, Invisinet, and um, so that's that's the kind of referral I'm looking for. What is Invisinet? What are they? What type of company are they? They're a data security uh, zero trust uh, network. Uh, they do um, uh, basically uh, make it so that hackers can't even see points of entry, like uh, 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 Internet of Things devices, devices that are typically not protected, are mm -hmm. are 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 shielded, and only trusted connections can come through. Um, and they're a pretty, they're a new startup. Um, and they, we did, we did their first explainer on their website. All right. Uh, and I will go, um, you mean, uh, so I'm going to share, you all know that I represent software development teams. Um, and our best clients are actually other digital marketing agencies that, may in fact have some of their own or one of their own or two developers on uh, on staff. And what I'm gonna show you is something that I'm working on. Uh, it's a break-even analysis um, for how do you decide if you um, should have somebody on staff or uh, outsource. And so it's the economics of outsourcing web development. Um, would love people's feedback. Uh, I'm happy to share this. So if you are paying somebody on staff, you're probably paying them, depending on where you are, about $80,000. There's payroll taxes, there's health insurance, other annual expenses, somewhere around $100,000. Um, if they could work every hour of the day for 50 weeks, or not every hour of the day, but 40 hours a week, it would be 2,000 hours. But we know that uh, it's more like 1600 if that. And if they could build a website in 80 hours, they could build in that year 20 websites. Um, but even if they were able to do that uh, and work every hour of those 1600 efficiently, they would still be uh, costing you $61 an hour. Um, so my teams typically, and, and I, I don't go to my lowest cost teams. This is uh, the $75 an hour is about the cost of a dual shore team. Uh, so you can see it's not much higher. 
than what you would be paying if you could have somebody who is full capacity, um, you know, using all 1600 hours. Um, and the break even there would be if you've got um, fewer than 15 sites to build, you're better off outsourcing, even with a 10% loss of efficiency for outsourcing. Um, and the other benefits, of course, are you've got the flexibility of allocating the excess work hours during peak demand. So never is it a situation where those, you know, uh, the, the work comes in smoothly and you could allocate it just so when the person is finishing their last website, they start the next. Never happens. Um, that one person or two people don't are not going to have the breadth of experience that a team will have that you would outsource to. And that means not just the platform that might they might not be familiar with, but the front end, the back end, the testing, and all of the other things that go into it. And then finally, uh, my teams do offer flat rate billing. So we will we will tell you, you know, we can do this job for five thousand or four thousand or six thousand. Uh, and we take on the risk if it runs over. Um, so this is something that I'm going to run by some of my clients to see what they think. Um, but would love any feedback from you all as well. That is just fantastic. Yeah. You like that? Okay. Neil, can you go back to it for a second? Sure, sure. Uh, let me share the screen again. Uh, share screen. I love these kind of smart things. I like, I, I wish I could, I wish I had the mind like this. Um, is this, does this, um, apply to every kind of website that I can mean, be created? Well, I mean, yes, pretty much. I mean, I, I've talked about websites. It's really any software development or almost any outsourcing, right? Um, you know, the question is, do I do it in-house? The reason why software is a good thing to outsource is because it's a, particularly in the world of marketing, is because your software developer is not likely to be a um, switch player or somebody who can, uh, you know, right. Um, right. can do design right. and do <laughs> copywriting yeah. and, and do you know, advertising, yeah. right. SEO. Yeah. So he's, he or she, mostly he is sort of a one, one trick pony. Um, and if all of your projects that come in are not, don't fit that one trick pony skill set, it's it's difficult to keep them busy all the time and use up all 1600 hours. Go ahead, John. The, the internal person also tends to be the person that says, my printer's not working. Can somebody come, can you come over and help? Um, yeah. So they tend to be the ad hoc IT support guy or gal right. instead right. of doing yep. their work. And if once you walk in, when I worked for Adobe, the worst mistake I ever made is walking into my lead developer's office to talk because uh, it cost me, a, um, you know, a better part of a day because he had to get, he had to, he had to roll down and then get rolled back up into his creative creative mode. Um, so yeah, the internal guys get distracted easily. Yeah, yeah. Are are those so, the pain points? The twenty for the twenty five to the twenty seven of those is that where your prospects really struggle? Twenty five to twenty seven. I'm sorry, what were you referring to? I just I'm, I'm looking at that. The Excel spreadsheet lines twenty five oh, oh, to twenty seven. Oh, you mean oh, these these? Uh, um, well, everything up here is all about sort of cost, right? Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, these are yes, absolutely. I mean, these are the reasons why you other reasons why you would outsource besides cost. Yeah, uh, I mean, some are time related. isn't a factor. Time isn't a factor. You couldn't outsource team couldn't do it faster than an um, in house team. It's hard to say. Uh, the, oh, I, I do have an efficiency loss associated with outsourcing because, you know, the person's not sitting right next to you. There is some That's efficiency loss. Um, yeah. And so I factor yeah. that in. Um, yeah. Is it 10 percent? Is it 20 percent? I don't know. But if you've got this little tool, you could you could yeah. you know, I can make this 20 percent. You could see the break even is now 13 websites. So, yeah, this is great. So and it also great. applies that you might have you might have you know, one developer, but more work than the 20 websites. Do you, do you hire a second developer? Right. Yeah. You know, if you're, right. if you're doing 25 websites, well, the extra five you'd want to outsource. Yep. One more question, John. 
you know, what constitutes a website? Because they 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 vary so widely. Is there is there a is there a mean a, a mean number of? Well, we we picked count? eighty hours. We picked eighty hours. That's probably a fairly straightforward, you know, six to ten page brochure site. If you're doing e-commerce, it's going to probably double. Um, and it depends, of course, if you're doing, uh, you know, these could go up to, uh, instead of a $7,500 site, this could be a, you know, a 10,000, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand dollar site, right? It, it really depends, but this is typical small business websites are in this range. Yeah, of course. I, get, I wonder when you said 20 websites times what, <laughs> what complexity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the agencies that we work with, they'll have, you know, websites that range from $3,000 up to $50,000. Uh, Michael, quick question. Yeah. Does this also include like sales funnels? What do you mean by that? I mean, like, for example, like click funnels is a pretty like popular product for, you know, like uh, pages for, you know, like for lead generation. Oh, you mean just uh, uh, one-off pages, things like that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I just, you know, used a standard website as an example. Of course, nothing is ever standard. So a small site, and that's also true, right? If if you need a quick turnaround and you don't want to distract, as John Parsons said, you're a lead developer who's working on this site for another client and focused and, you know, you don't want to distract and say, oh, we need this tonight. We need it, you know, we need it done because the client needs it right now. That's a good reason to outsource it. Keep your guy focused on what he's focused on so that he can get it done. So small stuff. And we do, we definitely do small stuff. And the, the reason we do it is because we want to be available for our, our, the agency partners that we work with. Yeah, my, Michael, I might um, sort of break it up into, uh -huh. you know, so I get the financial metrics and it's kind of like a break even, but I mean, there are huge uh, things like you have no HR liability, right? What if you hire the wrong guy? What if you have to fire the wrong guy? God forbid he does something screwed up or she does something screwed up. You don't want to manage people. You don't want to take on that huge liability. There's legal risk. There's, let's say you want to try and get rid of them and they take you to court. Um, you know, so. Yeah, I, yeah I would, that's I would, true. Would... That, that is true. Um, you can fire us at any time, right? And there's no consequences. Yeah, Good so I, I would actually just, you know, where you have 25 through 27, I'd break out like, you know, five or six things, right? I'd, I'd sort of do it. It's kind of break even on the cost. And let me let me go into that. Um, but here's all the things you don't have to deal with, right? Right. So it's like, hey, if we're breaking even on cost, would you want to do this? And then you show them the cost. And you're like, wow, that makes a lot of sense, right? So you don't have to hire people. You don't have to fire people. Legal liability. I mean, there's probably a ton of other things you can think of. Right. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, you can go back to the old Booz Allen Harvey balls or just do an X or check or whatever you want to do. And it's sort of like, yeah, for the same price, you avoid all these headaches. Right. Um, right. That, that That's the way I'm thinking about it. So I, I would sort of have sheet one be like your six selling points. Oh, and it's and, you know, sheet two being sort of, you know, here's the metric financial metrics. Right. Just a thought. I could be totally wrong. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. I just, as I say, I'm often wrong on many things. And this could be yet another. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for that feedback. Really helpful. All right. Let us move on. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to gallery mode. We are actually at the top of the hour. 